Michael, are you chatting to yourself? You're on mute. Oh, no, just uh, <laughs> scratch my beard. <laughs> okay, it's all lips and my one shirt. All right, folks, I'm going to wait about another minute or two before we get started. I believe we have presentations today. Hello. All right, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Quick reminder that this meeting is being recorded and sh posted to sh YouTube shortly thereafter. Your agreement to participate in these meetings is to also abide by our code of conduct. If you have questions about what that is, you can find it in the Security Technical Advisory Group's repository. Um, so. We have a relatively late agenda today. Hopefully we've got some presentations. I um, believe we were expecting to have a presentation from Build Packs and one other. Is that correct or am I making stuff up? Uh, Build Packs is definitely planning to present today. Awesome. Excellent. Happy to hear it. Um, so before we get started in the presentations, um, a couple of reminders for things that are outstanding. Um, folks, we've got our Trello board up and definitely needs some more feedback on breaking down those user stories into manageable tasks. It looks like um, we've made significant progress in that area, but can always use more. So as a quick reminder, if there is content in a user story that needs to be merged with another one, go ahead and make the comment or make the move. Um, if you have just commented and wanted a second set of eyes on it, hit me up in Slack or Dan or another member to go ahead and make the change. Everybody should have admin access to the board. If you don't and you would like it, let me know. I will also make the change. Um, and then if, as another reminder, everyone should have gone through and reviewed the best practices document that was also um, discussed previously, kind of breaking that apart more into examples. Um, we'd like to be able to take the content of the best practices doc and the steps by which um, we're expecting those builds to occur and integrate them within the reference architecture so we can take advantage of that within the user stories and get that incorporated. I think that's all the announcements and reminders. Did I miss any? Does anybody have any more? Nope. Okay. Uh, build packs. I'm going to hand it over to you to go ahead and start. Yeah. Just share my screen. Uh, can everyone see this? Yep. 
Uh, hi everyone, so I'm Sambhav Kothari. I'm one of the maintainers uh, on the Cloud Native Build Packs project. Today, uh, myself along with Steven and Matthew McNeil will be presenting um, a brief introduction to Build Packs and sort of the security, uh, some security focused features that we've baked in to the ecosystem. Um, so the agenda for today is uh, just a brief introduction to build packs, what they are, um, how they can help in various image building scenarios, uh, especially in the context of uh, security and supply chain, uh, and how and where can you use them. And at the end, we can we'll be uh, taking some questions that you may have on uh, our presentation. So. First of all, what cloud native build packs are. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, cloud native build packs are a way to transform your application source code into runnable images without Docker files. Now, you may be wondering why this is helpful. Um, through these slides, we'll focus on three main benefits that uh, this provides us. One, it allows application developers to focus on what they are building and not, not how to support it in production. Um, in that, it also has the added benefit of building and packaging the application better and faster than the application developers may have been able to do themselves. Um, it gives operators or DevSecOps teams precise control over what build inputs are permitted um, using the builder concept that we'll introduce in a few slides. Um, and lastly, the abstraction of built applications as a collection of distinct layers stitched together uh, to be an application image can allow for a system to precisely switch out one layer, for example, the base operating system layer from the image without disturbing any of the other layers. Um, and as we'll see, this can have some dramatic consequences for large scale reactions to OS vulnerabilities. So, going um, more into like the concepts of build packs and we'll be going over a bunch of these in the next few slides so what exactly are build packs um at the core of it a build pack is just two executables uh, one called detect which detects whether the build pack is needed or not and the other called build which does its part in building the final uh, application image for instance uh like a Java build pack could look for a .java file or an npm build pack could look at the presence of package.json file um, and then run subsequent uh, commands during the build step to install dependencies, uh, set up the environment, compile source, or set up some start commands. Um, interestingly, multiple build packs can also work together. So if you have, let's say, a full stack application that has a JavaScript front end and a Go back end, uh, you could have the JavaScript build pack compile the appropriate front end assets for you, whereas the Go build pack can run the back end server that serves it. Uh, this allows you to combine build packs and utilize them in a variety of, uh, like, in a in a combinatorial fashion. Uh, allowing you to build separate parts of your application as distinct layers. Um, one thing to note is that the Cloud Native Build Packs project actually doesn't produce build packs. Uh, rather, we define the specification, and then this is followed by a variety of different vendors um, who know the best on how to build these applications. So, some of the most well known build packs are produced by Google, Heroku, and the Picato project. Um, Speaking of distributing build packs, this also brings us to the concept of builders, which is one of the key ways uh, of distributing build packs. So builders are an ordered combination of build packs with a base build image and a run image. Uh, they're a convenient way of distributing all of the build logic for build packs in the format of an OCI image. Uh, the build image provides the base environment for the build packs, for example, uh, imagine an Ubuntu Bionic OS image with the appropriate build, build tooling, um, whereas the run image provides the base environment for the application image during runtime. Um, and a combination of these two images is called a stack. Um, it's very helpful to have these two images as separate images because build time dependencies can be left out of the application image, uh, making it smaller and lowering the attack surface area. Um, 
And as a platform operator, you can choose which builders are safe. You can construct builders out of different build packs that you like, and also define what sort of applications, languages, or base operating systems you want to support, and inject any necessary environment variable settings or proxy configuration certs, et cetera. Um, finally, uh, taking this builder image, your application source code together, uh, you have something known as a platform uh, that uses both of these as inputs to produce an output image. App developers don't have to know how any of this works. They just have to push their code and run a simple command that just uh, gives us input the application source code and the builder name, and the platform can automatically produce the output image. Um, under the hood, the platform actually uses the lifecycle, the reference implementation of which is maintained by the project. Uh, to run the appropriate build packs in order, uh, running the detect and build phases and uh, making sure that appropriate values are set in the output OCI image. This allows us to have a single tool that can take in different builders and build all kinds of applications. Um, now, this is how an image build operation typically works. However, we also expose a special kind of image creation operation unique to the build packs project called the rebase. Now, Rebase allows app developers or operators to rapidly update an application image when its run image has changed. By using image layer rebasing, this command avoids the need to do a full rebuild. At the end, uh, like all it's doing is changing like the pointer to the base operating system layers and today you have a new app image with the patched OS without having to rebuild your entire application from scratch. Uh, build packs can do this because uh, the output layers in the application image are distinct and we store appropriate metadata uh, about which layers are the base image and which layers are the application image. And we can use this metadata to do this kind of a rebase operation. So uh, moving on, um, like we've looked at all of these concepts and features. Uh, I wanted to call out a couple of them which this particular working group may be interested in. Um, and these are also features that I think have been talked about a lot recently. So first up, we have SBOM integration. So build packs allow you to generate a uh, software bill of materials during the build process itself. What this means is that you can have precise and accurate information about the components of your container instead of relying on heuristics and container scanners that scan the image after the container is built. This also allows you to have a full inventory of your uh, of any artifacts that you've compiled, uh, which often cannot be detected by container scanners. This improves the accuracy of the bill of materials generated uh, for the output image, and it also like reduces the actual scanning time needed uh, to go through the application image and figure out what components were installed in the first place. Um, Next up, we have separation of responsibilities and reusability. Uh, what that means is it allows different personas to do what they do best. Um, app developers can focus on application code. Build pack authors can provide good production quality container building logic for individual languages that they are experts in. And operators can choose to reuse these build packs along with base images that uh, they approve of. Uh, and provide this whole thing as a bundled builder for their users. And finally, we have the rebase operation, which we already talked about, which allows you to uh, mass update your base runtime images. So what all of these features enable you to do is these two workflows. So first, let's imagine we have like a bunch of applications. Using the SPOM information that we have in place, we have a good idea of what dependencies are in each of the application images, and we can figure out which of these are vulnerable. Uh, after we've identified the images, we can uh, like selectively update the application dependencies by updating the build packs that were used to create the image. So let's say you have a Go build pack that provides the Go compiler, and um, you notice that uh, it was using an older version or something, and you want to update it to the new one. Um, you can just update the build pack and 
uh, it will check the existing metadata and update the dependencies. You can do similar things for other languages. Um, and uh, something that Matthew will show us later, if you have a platform like KPAC, you can all, also do this uh, on a massive scale where you can pinpoint the exact applications that are using a build pack and a specific version of a build pack. And if it's updated, it automatically does a rebuild for each of these application images. Uh, you can imagine a similar workflow for base images and OS vulnerabilities. So uh, the plus side here is that because of the rebase operation, changing the base image, which used to be a particularly expensive operation in the typical Docker file world, suddenly becomes like a simple pointer change. And apart from the build time implications that it has, it also has runtime implications since you don't need to re-download all of the application layers on each of your nodes. You just need to download your base layer once and all the other app layers can be preserved as it is. Um, finally, looking forward on how like some of the features that we're focusing on to improve the security around uh, images built by build packs. Uh, we are looking to tighten and automate our security focused features even more. Uh, we are thinking of moving and integrating Cyclone DX as a standard SBOM format, uh, particularly because of a few reasons. One, it's extremely fast and lightweight to parse and analyze. Um, and a large part of the build packs project is how quickly it allows you to build your images. Um, the Cyclone DX format we've noticed is also highly automatable um, and it has a very good tooling ecosystem. Um, and it comes from OWASP, uh, it has a OWASP group, so it comes from a security focused group. Uh, and while preserving uh, security uh, or vulnerability information, it can also capture compliance information using SPDX license tags. Um, and there's an RFC in place where we propose this as the standard format for Bellpack's SBOM output. Uh, if you're interested, you can take a look and comment on it. Uh, apart from that, we're also looking into six store and cosine integration. Um, this is again been a hot topic recently. Um, cosine seems very promising in that it does not require any external dependencies apart from uh, a Docker registry, which you would already have if you're building container images. Um, it works for like old registries as well. And I think recently it also added a SPOM support um, so that you can also sign in and attach uh, SPOMs to your container images. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, cosine integration, we have a pack issue and a K pack RFC for the same. Um, Finally, how and where can you use build packs? Uh, build packs can be used in a bunch of places. Today, we will be demoing two uh, popular platforms. One is Pack, which is a CLI tool that allows you to build container images. Uh, it primarily relies on the Docker daemon. Uh, and the other is Kpack, which is a Kubernetes native build service. Um, and it can uh, work without privileged builds. Uh, it can run without privileged permissions and does not require any daemon whatsoever. Uh, and it also allows you to manage your images and scale. Uh, so first up, the uh, pack um, demo. Can everyone see the Kathakoda website? Cool. Uh, so this is just part of a normal documentation and I'm running like the sample builder and um, sample app repository that we have. Uh, I just want to know that this is a sample builder and this is not an actual production builder. Uh, as I noted earlier, uh, like the project itself does not maintain any production quality build packs or builders. So if you're trying to use it, uh, please use it with one of the uh, production quality build packs in our registry. Uh, so I'm going to do some simple commands uh, just to clone a samples repository and go inside the a sample Java app. And this is all it takes to build an application image. So you provide the application image name and the builder you want to use. And that's it. Everything happens automatically. 
So as you can see, it's pulling the latest uh, builder image um, and the latest run image. Um, and then it's just detecting the application. It detected that it's a Java application and then it's trying to install Maven dependencies here. Um, takes a while the first time you run it. Oh, uh, yes, finally, uh, that's done. Um, so once it's compiled the whole application, it's just uh, exporting the output layers and adding any additional metadata so that uh, we can like do further operations like rebase and attach the SPOM to the image, et cetera. Uh, and finally, it's caching some layers, um, which are actually not part of the output app image, but they're stored locally. Um, and if you do a rebuild, for example, it should take a lot less time this time. So another thing to note is that all builds produced by build packs are reproducible in the sense that if you have two um, source repositories which are exactly the same and you have a builder that's exactly the same, it outputs the same exact digest. Uh, we do so by zeroing out the timestamps in the output image. So if you inspect your um, uh, image and if you see it being created like 40 years, sorry, years ago or something, uh, you will know why. It's because uh, we are trying to make these builds reproducible and uh, this is a side effect of that. Uh, but as you can see, we have an image now. Let's try and run it. Um, okay, so that should be it. And if we just open it, and there we go. Uh, we have an application image. Um, although this uh, like seemed like a long journey for an actual app developer, uh, they already have the code in place, and they can also set a default builder which can automatically handle multiple languages. So most of the times, the only argument they're supplying is pack build, the application image name, that's it. Um, and that's it for the pack demo. Uh, I believe Matthew is gonna show us a demo with KPack that deals with detecting uh, vulnerabilities and patching and rebuilding images, uh, multiple images at once. Hi everyone, I'm Matthew. I work on the KPAC project, which really is about leveraging cloud native build packs and the features provided for them at scale. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, to do a quick demo. All right, can everyone see my screen with a lot of green boxes? Excellent. So what we're looking at right now is a visualization of a KPAC install. So what each of these boxes represent is an actual image that KPAC knows about and is aware of. Um, and as we can see, we have about 30 some images here. They're all built with unique source code and they're built using build packs originated from the Paquetta projects. So if you look, or if you can see, it's not important, but in here, each of these image actually calls out the exact build packs that were used to build them. And what the last demo was showing was the ability for build packs to, uh, with the pack CLI, easily build an image. Uh, and KPAC's really leveraging that tech technology and build packs uh, at scale. So it's managing all these images. Um, keeping track of the dependencies inside of them and is able to, as we kind of discussed earlier, automatically rebuild them um, if there's an update to patch a vulnerability. So what I'm gonna work through in this demo is actually showing off the earlier slides in the demo that were showing all the different images um, that had a updated stack and showing just how KPAC can uh, handle that and update a fleet of, fleet of images quickly at scale. 
So in this visualization here with all these boxes representing an image, they're all green right now, which represents in KPAXI up to date. And what I'm gonna do purely in this visualization is I'm gonna take the first couple characters of the stack. I'm just gonna copy it here. And I'm gonna go in here and just for demo sakes, I'm gonna mark it as vulnerable, which is gonna mean that all the images in here in this visualization are now red, which is just our way of showing that we know that this particular underlying stack run image has a vulnerability in it and we'd like to get it updated. So for the sake of demo, I, and one sec, let me get a terminal. I'm gonna just run a simple command called update stack, which is gonna just push a new stack image uh, to the registry and tell KPAC about it. So as we can see, it's pushing and updated. It's already given us a new image with a new digest. And if we just give it a second, KPAC is gonna uh, detect all of these images that previously had the old run image. And it's gonna, as you can see, queue them up and it's scheduling rebuilds of them. And before I'm even done explaining what's happening, uh, as we can see, they are fixed. So in that time, all 30 some images were scheduled a rebuild of them and patched with the new underlying uh, run image. As you can see, none of them are red anymore because they're using that new underlying run image digest. That was really fast across all these images. And the reason we were able to do that so fast, is, as mentioned earlier, we're actually leveraging the rebase operations. So we're not scheduling a full rebuild of all of them. We're just scheduling a simple build that is gonna take the new run image, uh, rebase the, uh, the image on the registry with the new underlying stack run image. Um, the other thing KPAC can do is actually rebuild Hold on one images. Second. Aditya, your microphone is live and we can hear you typing. Sorry about that. Thanks. Cool. So the other thing I'll show is just like the run image, uh, some dependencies are provided by the build packs. So, uh, what I can do in this visualization is similar to what I did a second ago. I can mark a build pack as a, a dependency provided by KPAC that is vulnerable. So I am for this demo just going to mark the Paquetto Belsoft Liberica build pack, which is a build pack that provides the underlying JVM. Um, as vulnerability. So you can imagine if there's a necessary fix in the JVM, uh, we'd want to rebuild a fleet of images built with that um, dependency. So if I save this, not all the images in the cluster, uh, because obviously some are built with other build packs and other languages runtimes, but all the ones built with this version of Belsoft Liberica and Java have now been marked as red. And what I can do is similar to before, I can do an update build pack and tell this uh, kind of very simple tool that we built just to kind of visualize what KPAC is doing to go ahead and generate a new version of this underlying Java build pack. So this is actually pushing a new version up and it's gonna tell KPAC about that. And in a second, once it gets uploaded, looks like it did, KPAC's actually gonna, uh, rebuild uh, the underlying builder image that built these images. And as we can see, it's already detected the handful of images built with that version of Belsoft Liberica um, as needing a rebuild. And as you can see, it's spinning here, which is visualizing that an actual build has started up. So in a little bit of time, we should see is fixed. And this is pretty fast too, because it's able to leverage the speed of build packs and the underlying build pack cache. But it is a little slower than the operation I did a second ago, because this, unlike the rebase, uh, is actually scheduling uh, full rebuilds. It's doing a full rebuild of the image. Uh, 
Not too slow though, because it is already finished, as we can see here. All Matthew, the images. Can I ask a question? Oh, yep, go for it. In addition to the visualization, are you also intending to share a terminal? I, see, I hear you talking about certain things happening in the background, but we're not actually seeing those until we start the updates. Sure, I'm happy to share um, terminal. Um, I'm curious what you want to see. I'm happy to show the underlying statuses update, show logs. Um, what would you like to know a little bit more about? I was curious if, if you were actually sharing one or not, if you were an intended. Oh, That's, oh no. I saw your cursor moving around and talking about certain things we weren't actually seeing. The, but, the only terminal I have is just running two commands to update versions inside of KPAC. Gotcha. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. Um, so this is actually kind of the extent of my demo. I just uh, was kind of wanted to show how that underlying build packs technology utilizing the KPAC platform can uh, manage this fleet of multiple unique images and automatically rebuild them when it's being made aware of updates. I am going to stop sharing now unless there's any other questions or folks would like clarification on anything else. Yeah, uh, thanks, Matthew. This, this was really good. I have one question. Uh, sure. So, uh, here it shows the, the vulnerability being fixed in the runtime. But what about the user's application dependence? If they are like, I have Python application and I'm bringing some dependencies with me. Yeah, so are those also going to get handled? I mean, and what is the responsibility of the developer to, if they are getting automatically fixed, uh, how developers are getting awareness of those? Yeah, that's a great question. So currently what KPAC does is it tracks the underlying stack, which is the operating system uh, and packages, as well as the build packs that, um, will most likely provide uh, low language runtime, like the Python runtime or uh, the JVM. The underlying de application dependencies uh, are still going to be managed by the underlying app developer teams. Um, so uh, at this time, the, the app developer teams would still need to update uh, their underlying application and tell KPAC about it to rebuild. Uh, but the kind of the S bomb kind of we were discussed earlier should make it easier for like the downstream or the the platform operators to be more of to be made aware of what dependencies in the app so they could work with the app teams to update them. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay. yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to add that since build packs can contain arbitrary logic, uh, you can actually just um, have a build pack that does some basic vulnerability scanning for like Node or Python, and maybe even error the build out um, if it knows, no, notices some vulnerable components being used. You can also have it auto fix some of those things, although that may not be desirable by app developers. But if you are the operator, you can choose to do all of these operations and automate all of this. Um, Build packs provide a framework to allow you to easily detect and do these sort of operations. But in terms of what you actually do, it, it's entirely up to you as an operator. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I had the last couple of slides um, that I left over, although it's not much. Uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the platforms that. Um, uh, allow using build packs to build images. So we already know about pack and KPAC, but we all, uh, we also have integrations with GCP, GitLab, Tekton, um, and a bunch of others. Uh, we also, like, you can also use these images and deploy them to various cloud providers. So AWS, GCP, OpenShift, et cetera. Um, and if you're interested or curious about contributing back to the project, here are some community links. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I just know if you have any questions about the presentation in general or any of the other features we discussed.
Uh, great demo. Um, I, I have a couple of uh, questions. Um, I think one of the first ones is uh, what uh, can, you know, um, sort of end user security folks do to sort of validate the platform of build, you know, the build packs, the, the platform that, you know, is using to actually build the build packs. Like what can we do to make sure, for example, that we didn't, you know, download a vulnerable version of, of build packs itself? Uh, I think in terms of like the platforms, again, like the build pack project itself only owns a single platform, which is the pack CLI. Um, so I believe um, currently we provide like digests and um, uh, checksums for you to validate the binary that you're using for pack for other platforms. Um, I think they would have to speak for themselves on how they validate this. Um, it, yes. it's, it sounds like you're saying maybe they should use six door. <laughs> yes. Uh, I say this, sorry, just for, for full transparency, I, I work with the six door project, but this is exactly the, the, the use case that six door is trying to, you know, how do you bootstrap the trust? Like, what do you base yourself on? You know, what's the turtle at the bottom sort of thing? So that's, that's exactly what six door is trying to provide some help with. Definitely. I think uh, we currently also ship back CLI as a container image. We can look into signing that. And I believe there's also the S get um, sort of demo from six door, which provides like a double get equivalent to that. Um, but yeah, we, we will definitely look into that as well. What challenges are you all experiencing with some of these integrations? Uh, Steven, do you want me to take that? Sure. Is this about, are you wondering about integrations with platforms or just uh, kind of with platforms, with some of the other open source projects, um, whether or not we're missing specifications or standards or any kind, pretty much anything that you can think of. So for, for your awareness, we're working on of creating a reference architecture for organizations to be able to adopt and we're exploring the current technology landscape and trying to fill in those gaps. Got it. I, I think the probably one of the most uh, contentious, you know, parts of the specification that we're working on right now uh, is how we handle installing additional operating system packages. So, you know, we, we have this kind of clean API for keeping, you know, application layers contractually separate from, you know, the base image layers, but operating system packages are generally arbitrary functions that apply on top of the base image. And so as soon as an application needs to install additional operating system packages, you lose a lot of the benefits of rebasing for that application because you can't, you know, you have to make a custom base image just for that application, right? You can't do things at scale anymore, you know, really quickly like what um, Matt McNew showed uh, with KPAC. So we're, we're working on ways of, uh, you know, adding support for adding operating system packages on a per app basis for lots of apps at the same time into the API so that we kind of for those use cases where you know you have a Ruby app that uses image magic and your base image is missing the image magic C library, things like that. Um, you have a couple you have operating system package options and build pack options for solving that problem that have different trade-offs. So I think that's that's kind of one of the really big ones. Um, deciding on a standardized SBOM format is another one that's you know a really interesting problem right now. <laughs> I think we really like uh, Cyclone DX. Um, the uh, just uh, mostly due to the supported tooling in the space for uh, kind of automated vulnerability matching against the SBOM is, looks really nice. Um, but you know, there's still a lot of questions about which way the ecosystem will go there. Uh, so that's that's kind of something that's in flight. Um, I think there's a big effort right now to reduce complexity in the project, especially we have a lot of terms like stack and builder and you know build pack that make it a little inaccessible for new users coming in you know, who want to understand how the project works, understand the specification. And so we're trying to spend a little time before, you know, bumping all the version numbers to 1.0 to say, let's let's cut the, um, you know, some of the terminology and remove some of the complexity that's built up over time based on individual features that you know, may not have panned out the way we thought. Um, so we're hoping in, in a couple months, everything is a lot more consumable for end users. So I don't know, those are just some things. <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, does that kind of answer your question? Sure. It does. Um, 
I'm I'm curious for the other folks on the call. How are we How are we feeling about build build packs and everything that's been presented, given our other discussions? So I'm curious on the build pack specifically, what languages does it support? And do you run into challenges with clients that are doing something like a statically compiled binary, go lang, pick your language. And does that mean that if they're doing something that build pack doesn't work now, we have two solutions for a single client that they have to implement? Yep, that makes sense. So the build packs project just provides specification and tooling for a platform to implement build packs, which is a, it's a, like, it's a lot of stuff. So like the, I think the key thing that the build packs project creates is a life is the set of binaries called the life cycle that knows how to run build packs, export layers in this way. It makes it really easy for a platform to implement running build packs like Tecton. It's just a single YAML file that implements the whole thing. Um, so the, the platform provides a lot of spec and tooling and all that, but doesn't provide actual build pack implementations. Those are you know, the responsibility of there's a, another Linux Foundation project and the Cloud Foundry Foundation called uh, Picado that provides a really, you know, I think probably eight different language ecosystems worth of <laughs> build packs, probably over 100 build packs total um, that I think covers, you know, Python, Go, Node, Java, keep going. Um, but Google also has build pack implementations that cover a lot of languages. Um, Salesforce does too uh, for Heroku and, and their uh, Evergreen is our other platform. Um, so there's there's a, a pretty big ecosystem of build packs available. It's also not hard to create your own if you need to. Um, you know, the uh, we haven't seen issues supporting most common languages. Like you, you know, you said. Um, uh, for Go, where you're building static binaries, you know, the Picado project has like a, a distrilis like image that's kind of um, uses uh, Ubuntu Bionic underneath, uh, you know, to do for the build process um, that, uh, you know, works really well for producing small statically compiled Go apps, but where you want maybe glibc on the image, <laughs> you know, in addition to that. Um, the Because the run image and build image can be separate, you kind of get this like you know, every build is a multi-stage Docker file build, sort of effect. Yeah. I mean, when you say that, I'm thinking, does the rebase only apply to half your images then? Because some of the images you're going to have to do a build on and other ones, you can just do a quick rebase of those layers. Uh, so like, are, are you wondering about like, if you did a, a, a during the I'm, build? Yeah, I'm thinking of the demo we, we saw, you know, you got 30, 40 images out there and you just quickly swapped out a layer because all that is is just a quick little manifest change in the Docker image and that's easy to do. But if you have to do a build to create a statically compiled binary right. in a build step and you're swapping layers out there, you still have to do a compile in there. Yeah, generally build packs uh, try to dynamically link their runtimes as much as possible so they can take advantage of that rebasing. Um, it's it's probably good security practice not to include static libraries in your build image for that reason, uh, if you're going to use rebasing so that when you do that rebase, you don't end up with the static libraries copied into the, you know, um, statically compiled binaries uh, and then a rebase that doesn't have any effect. So build pack authors and users are responsible for managing that. Uh, if you have Go binaries that link a lot of static C libraries or C++ applications that link a lot of you know uh, C, C libraries that exist in that base image part, then it's definitely something you have to worry about. Uh, we don't, there's no, no magic there, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Some of the stuff I was throwing in the chat about the OCI spec and them putting it in there is a little bit thinking about how this can apply to the bigger ecosystem. And so it's not just a build pack specific thing, but maybe there are other tools out there that can integrate, you know, if people get into scenarios that don't fit nicely, you can do a plug and play in there. And so build pack fits in where it fits in. And if they need other stuff, they can plug in other tooling in there. Yeah, I think the uh, a challenge is that the rebase operation, it, it, it can lead, if you're not very careful about how you use it, this is what, I'll, this is kind of a reason for the build pack API. If you're not very careful about how you use that rebase operation, you can actually create security vulnerabilities. So for example, if you have an operating system package that modifies Etsy password, right? You get a copy of Etsy password in a subsequent layer and say there's a vulnerability that requires changing a user that's patched in the lower layer, and you replace the lower layer, right? You're not, that, that change isn't gonna permeate to the higher layers. So the, the kind of a big, reason behind the build pack API is it keeps really contractually, the build happens as a normal user, keeps really contractually separate layers for different parts of the application, and then uses path, LD library path, C path, things like that, in order to create the environment. And so that's a, a lot of 
I'd, I'd say most of what it is is a way to enable safe rebasing of those lower layers, if that makes sense. It's not something you'd want to do with a, a Docker file that installs packages, try to swap the lower things out. <laughs> it doesn't yeah, I think, I think people that are looking at their OCI um, on that annotation they were thinking of adding on there were seeing that exact same problem. So there a lot of them were saying, you know, we're not going to try to do a rebase. This is just our trigger to do a rebuild. And so if they have that, annotation in there, they know when they need to do it at least. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the, the annotation adds a, um, the original you know, image digest of the base image. Um, we can't actually use that with the build packs project because we don't want to assume that the previous image is still available on the registry. So we have to add another you know, annotation in addition to that to say, here's actually the, the top layer digest. Um, but it's still useful to understand you know, what, what base image digest your application came from. I think it's a good feature for OCI. Alex had a question. I think um, that may be what he was just saying about the, uh, the, the sort of separation of the rebase uh, may help answer some of my question. But I was, I was wondering in a, um, in a supply chain security context, one of the things we're worried about is if um, something that we've brought in from upstream is has been compromised, and um, if that's been if that compromised upstream dependency has been stored in the cache, and we just keep rebuilding off of that cache, are we just reusing the compromised um, package? If that makes sense, um, or you know, if we want to build out of a um, registry that we own and know, so that we um, have built everything from source and we have a little bit more assurance about what's in there um, to avoid some of those issues. How hard is, are those sorts of things to, to manage and manipulate inside of build packs? Well, I think the nice thing about a build pack is that because you have that ability to do complex arbitrary logic during the build process, you know, and you're getting that logic from a trusted source, you can you know, do whatever you need to do to verify your dependencies, even if they're pre-cached, right, before the next build. And the only things that a build pack can't, you know, might not have complete control over are things where the, the digest stays exactly the same from the last build, like the base image, right? The build pack doesn't can't pick the base image digest for the, for the you know, runtime base image. Um, so there's there's a lot of kind of ability to, you know, create many layers of security for doing that verification in the build process because of this kind of modular API where you can say, you know, um, where you can you know get logic from a trusted source and control how it executes. Is there any concern that, that that arbitrary logic would then sort of break the reproducibility of some of those builds? Yeah, that's, that's actually it's a really good point. So when, you know, as Sam said earlier, we, you know, build packs result in reproducible images. What that really means is the build pack API lets, if, if build packs produce reproducible artifacts, the build pack API does as much as it can to ensure that the base image in the end is reproducible. So your build packs have to produce the same output given the same input, the, the timestamps will get fixed automatically uh, for, for files. But you know, aside from that, um, you know, it, it does rely on the build pack supporting that functionality too. And so if you include a build pack that produces an artifact that's not reproducible, you won't get a reproducible, you won't get the same thing at the end. So that's definitely a limitation. Um, another, quick question, uh, uh, another quick question. Another quick question. So I don't know if it's part of the build pack spec or um, the, the, the individual responsibility of, of the folks building the actual packs, um, but can you also generate SBOMs for uh, what was used to build the individual layers so that you know, somebody would know this library was compiled with GCC version X? So that there are two SBOMs that get produced. There's one that gets Currently, there's one that gets put on the image itself, and there's one, uh, and the one that gets put on the image is reflective of the contents of the image. And there's one that, for reproducibility reasons, actually, because we want to be able to produce the same digest, even if you know your ver version of curl that you use to download the thing changes, right? Um, uh, there's a separate SBOM that gets produced as a file at the end. Uh, that's a build time SBOM that contains all the build tools. We're working on moving both those to Cyclone DX. There's a current RFC to do that. Um, and we may al actually allow you to put the build time one on the image if you want to. Also, some people feel like if the build tools change, then you should, you know, always, it's good to get a separate digest, then your inputs weren't exactly the same. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so, uh, you know, you, I'm speculating here for sure because it's still an RFC, but you could imagine, uh, you know, you do a build and you end up with two Cyclone DX formatted SBOMs that have 
uh, build time dependencies and runtime dependencies, and they're baked onto the image. And you can use tooling to, you know, look at the inspect the image for security vulnerabilities, even if those vulnerabilities are introduced in build tools. I think one other good thing is that since build packs like contribute layers, which have, make some sense or semantic rather than just an arbitrary collection of commands. You can also specify that this dependency came from this layer or this command. Um, so that's also something we've talked about in our RFC is that if a build pack produces a certain layer, it can attach a bomb with that layer itself. So if we swap out that layer in the future or like in, in, like in a rebuild process, some build pack is excluded for whatever reason, we can be more clever about what bill of materials that's finally merged together gets generated. So we are only merging together and generating the parts that were present in the final image while still being efficient about it. And also knowing the source of where it came from. So which build pack contributed it and which layer those dependencies live on. Yeah, thanks. I was actually going to ask the same question. Like, if we do the rebasing, how does the S bomb gets? Uh, how does that changes get reflected in the S bomb? Because you are not actually rebuilding the whole application, right? So, uh, I think you, as you said, if you have those uh, references to the layers, then you can easily update the S bomb. And is that the same way you are doing updating the S bomb on uh, rebasing? Okay. Yeah. So, as I said, since like the the bill of materials that are currently produced are attached to layers and a build pack instead of the whole container image. We know exactly, like based on the uh, references in the manifest, like which layers are present. So let's say in the rebase operation, the base operating system images are uh, changed. We can take the new S1 for the base images and the new one for the app images and try to combine them together and put them out. Um, so the the only operation we're doing is a merge together um this is still very much an rfc uh like we're still figuring out how to uh, handle these kind of operations but that's the sort of direction we are thinking since we already have all of these things in place uh like it, it should be very easy for us to implement this We've got about nine minutes left. Any other questions, Sherpat? Yeah, shifting gears a little bit, what advice or considerations do you have for organizations that want to build this into large internal systems that are not the ones you already support? Like in, in your journeys, what does like that zero to production look like? Um, by, by build this, do you mean like, uh, uh, you know, take build packs and create an internal platform that uses build packs and offers those to developers, something kind of like that. Correct. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I'd say the, uh, maybe, maybe Sam and McNew actually would kind of have a better, better take on this. They uh, both yeah. Work. I mean, um, so like, uh, I'm personally, a. ML platform engineer in Bloomberg, and uh, like we had to adopt this platform internally. I think, in terms of considerations, um, like the major thing to think about is like building some of these things from source, and like some of the build packs download things from the internet, figuring out the right proxies for them, or like if you have the private registries, figuring out how to replace them. Um, that's a major part of it. I think uh, like some of the build back projects and ecosystems allow you to easily replace or provide a proxy for some of the artifacts they use. Um, so it's still very much manageable, but like those are the typical considerations, like figuring out um, what kind of policies you have in place in your company and um, like trying to adopt this whole ecosystem internally. Um, so figuring out trusted mirrors or building from source where you have to. Gotcha, that makes sense. Sounds like something we want to factor in into our secure software factory, 
I was I was just going to recommend that um, that's an open question that we need to still figure out is whether or not our architecture is going to refer to a configuration file for pointing to internal mirrors or if we're going to recommend that folks just go out to the internet for grabbing everything. I have my own opinions on this, but I'm interested to see where what direction we end up taking. So I'm wondering also, I feel like as we're having all these presentations, maybe we can start um, annotating the different stories with all the projects or the folks that are involved with those discussions. And then, you know, we could, we could from there, we could figure out breakout groups as well. Good point, adding it to the reminder section of our meeting doc. Okay, if no one has any other questions, so take the rest of this week up until Thursday to continue to go through those user stories and those tasks. You can begin assigning yourself some tasks. Um, also put the association of any tooling projects, points of contact against those particular tasks and user stories to capture a lot of this. Um, if you happen to come across something that we need as a group to make a decision on, go ahead and drop it in the Slack channel. That way we can bring it up as a topic of conversation at the next meeting. Um, but expectations for next week, unless Dan Pop overrides me, uh, we're going to be doing a review of all those stories and tasks, determine what's missing, begin prioritization and assignment. Does that sound good? I'll do a quick addition also. If you think of any projects that also may be good to include, but are not necessarily part of the current discussion, uh, if you can add that in as well, we can try and reach out to those projects. Hey, super quick, like last minute thought. Uh, Steven, you, you talked about Tecton passing by. Uh, I'm Googling like for that integration, found some great documentation and the link to the wrap up. Do you have a, a sense of like how mature and stable that is? So the, the Tecton integration, um, it, like it, it's, it's, you know, it uses the Tecton catalog. It's a, a template for Tecton. It's not, you know, extra controllers or things like that. Right. And so it has some limitations, um, around like, you know, K, K pack as controllers that are built against build pack specifically, for example. And so it can understand when a build pack is, uh, you know, uh, there's a one old build pack version out of all the build pack versions your app uses and know to do a rebuild. Right. It's kind of, it does that. Know, management at scale. Tech, Tecton is more like it can do one-off builds of applications when you trigger a pipeline. It's more like the PAC CLI, uh, you know, um, it's, it's kind of like if you had the PAC CLI integrated into a Tecton pipeline, but instead of using PAC and Docker, it uses Kate's containers to do the build. It doesn't require any nested containers, if that makes sense. Um, gotcha. So the integration you know, it uses mature tooling, you know, you know, project lifecycle is part of it. It supports all the existing build packs in the ecosystem as a thing that does a build. It's, you know, it does a great job as far as I know. Um, you know, does it give you some of the, you know, kind of fancier features of the API, rebasing, things like that? You know, you'd have to implement that separately, if that makes sense. Sweet, super useful. No more afterthoughts. Thank you. Emily, back on to you. All right, I'll give everybody back three minutes of their day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the cool presentations. See you soon. Priya, time to log off. Because you're not on your computer. I got spaced out.